The 2011-2012 Medical Dental Legal Update continues with Physician Hospital Integration, Pros and Cons, featuring Jason M. Odell, CWM. Mr. Odell is a principal of the financial consulting firm Odell Jarvis Mandel, LLC, with offices in Ohio, Texas, Florida, Arizona, and New York. He is a co-author of the books For Doctors Only, A Guide to Working Less and Building More, and for Ohio Doctors, Shedding Light on Asset Protection, Tax and Estate Planning. Mr. Odell has experience as an entrepreneur, financial consultant, and investment advisor. He has worked with high net worth and physician clients for over 18 years and was recognized by Medical Economics as one of the best financial advisors to physicians. You may contact Mr. Odell with your questions or comments at 877-656-4362 or by email at odell at ojmgroup.com. Hello and welcome. My name is Jason O'Dell. I'm a principal at the OJM Group, national consulting firm for physicians, representing a little over a thousand physicians in all 50 states and three foreign countries. Today's topic that we will be discussing is hospital employee or not. The benefits of potentially becoming a hospital employee and the cons of becoming a hospital employee. We'll look through a number of case studies. We'll cover topics that range in how the deal is structured to the benefit plans that are available. We'll cover a number of different areas, drill, drilling down on various case studies so that you can get a good picture as to whether what you should be looking at if this is indeed something you are considering doing. The slide that you'll be looking at right now is a disclaimer slide that we use for all of our presentations. And really the purpose of this, this, of this slide is to make sure when you're going to engage a firm that they have proper licenses, that they have proper uh, designations and individuals that are experts in various areas. These things are extremely important when evaluating whether to hire a firm like ours or another firm to help you with various issues, whether they're legal issues, tax issues, financial issues, insurance issues or investment issues, proper designation is extremely important. In order to review those, there are background checks you can complete, just as if a physician is going to be doing surgery, brain surgery on someone, a patient will more often than not check the background of that physician, check whether they've had malpractice claims or not. It's extremely important that you do the same when you do that, when you begin to work with a consulting firm or a planning firm. Before we get into the various topics we're going to cover today, let's just set the groundwork for where we are in terms of the state of hospitals purchasing medical practices. In 2003, 8% of medical groups belong to a medical group management association that was hospital owned. In 2008, that number is, was 10%. That may not seem like a large percentage point increase, but it was a 25% increase from where it was just five years earlier. Why is that happening? Is that happening because physicians feel safety in numbers? Do they feel financially hospitals are stronger than their own medical practice can be? There are lots of different reasons and we'll get into that. In High Point, North Carolina, it is estimated that 70 percent of all medical practices are hospital owned. It's a staggering number in one community to be all hospital owned. What was the case there? Could have it been that the managed care system in that, in that town or that state prompted physicians to gravitate towards hospitals? There can be lots of different reasons, but until you're educated on all the various financial aspects and reasons that you would want to go into a hospital-owned practice or be an employee, it's hard to make that decision. Top reasons 
for leaving private practice. Some of the reasons that you would leave private practice, reduced reimbursements from the insurers and Medicare and a feeling of safety going to a hospital that that can be controlled now by the hospital, potentially. Increased complexity in the billing and coding system and having the hospital be able to do that and all the manpower that they have can handle that for you and remove that from your practice. The increased tension that each practice has of being audited, whether that's a Medicare, Medicaid audit, or whether that's a tax audit or a health insurance company audit. There are a number of different reasons why that tension of being audited, tension of being audited, physicians find themselves gravitating towards the hospital. The difficulty in recruiting physicians into the private practice setting is a very difficult thing to do now and with the hospital's potential deep pockets and network, it potentially can be easier. The lack of awareness of the financial benefits of private practice and not understanding the corporate structure, tax planning, benefit planning that can be done at the practice level will also lead physicians to go to a hospital-based system. And upon doing that, it's just the fact that they weren't educated on all the tools that are out there and available to them that they could have employed. And that lack of knowledge causes them to head towards the hospital-owned system. A survey in 2009 by the American College of Cardiology found that only 33% of cardiologists expect to remain in private practice or a small group practice. Another 38.1% said they will actively pursue integration in a healthcare system, partly in response to the CMS proposal to cut the overall cardiology fee by about 20%. Again, is that just a specialty that's heading towards the hospitals and being bought up, or is this a recurring theme that we're seeing in many specialties? The obvious healthcare bill passed in 2010 uh, caused a lot of physicians to evaluate where their future may lie and do, can they continue to manage through all the different rules, laws, and regulations that are coming out in the business aspect of practice and focus on the patient part of practicing. Can they do all of that in a private practice setting or are they better off at a hospital setting? Misconceptions can lead to bad decisions by physicians. The fact of the matter with physicians not necessarily knowing all the benefits that are available to them and overestimating the benefits of the hospital system can provide and underestimating the benefits that they can receive from being available or, or staying in private practice is a big concern. If specialists fully understand how easily and efficiently they could increase revenue, reduce costs, and increase net after-tax income. It is our belief that the trend towards hospital employment would slow significantly. Today's topic will cover about six to eight different areas. One, why sell your medical practice? We'll specifically drill down onto that. What financial structure is being offered and how are they going to compensate you for the purchase of your medical practice, if at all? The current benefits that you have in your practice versus what the hospital benefits are. Scheduling patient hours, vacation time, call schedule are all important things that need to be considered if making a decision to join a hospital group. We'll cover that. What are the current staff's job security if you're purchased by a hospital? What happens with all the other medical practice assets that are owned? Are those purchased in the hospital or not? We'll talk about the medical malpractice coverage and what is the state of that. We'll discuss a couple case studies. We'll also talk maybe about some additional options of staying in private practice and not joining a hospital organization or being purchased. And then we'll summarize things. Why sell your medical practice? 
really can be talked about in a number of different terms. For today, we'll look at three areas of why selling your medical practice. practice. Financial reasons, management reasons, and strength in numbers. When we look at the financial reasons, what we find often there is there is a potential for a reduction in expenses and overhead. There's the increased financial security for the practice. There's a potential of lack of income for the physicians for a number of years and not have to worry about the ebbs and flows of patients paying bills and insurance carriers remitting reimbursement to the physician practice. Those financial reasons range in, in, in a number of different things, but nor, more often than not, the medical practice feels that by being purchased, a lot of those financial concerns are no longer their burden, and they are put back onto the employer or the hospital for them to burden with, and they can focus on non-financial related issues in their business. Management reasons. Another reason for considering the sale of a medical practice to a hospital. This reason can be reducing the stress of dealing with employees. The physician owner who manages the practice and is responsible potentially for hiring and firing or has the ultimate decision in the hiring and firing of employees can eliminate that responsibility by joining the hospital. That burden now moves over to the hospital. Therefore, all employee reviews, all hiring, all the firing, the daily issues that relate to human resources are potentially moved off of the physician's plate and into the hospital's plate. But is this actually truly the case? Probably not, only because the hospital administration isn't working in the day-to-day -day environment of the medical practice. The physician and the other office manager is, so there will still be responsibility that will fall upon the physician and the office management, even if it is a hospital-owned group. There are the ideas that EMR implementation will be provided by the hospital and, will, and is provided by the hospital, and that will eliminate their ability to have to manage that process and that expense that goes along with that as well. Reduced responsibility of managing the practice from a compliance, billing, marketing area as well are things that physicians will gravitate towards at least exploring the idea of the hospital purchasing them. There's the concept of strength in numbers as a reason that you would consider to be purchased. Those that strength in numbers of having a multi-specialty group, a hospital administration that is large in size with a number of employees that provide good negotiating powers with managed care companies and vendors out there is a reason and a valid reason to, to look at considering a hospital as an, employee, uh, as an employer. These negotiating with insurance carriers and getting on their panels and the paperwork that you have to complete is a long process. It takes a long time. And now if you can streamline that through the hospital and not have to have that process in your office, it tends to make a lot of sense. The concern is that physicians overvalue the strength in numbers and feel as if the hospital will provide them patients and or uh, eliminate some of these key areas. The end of the day is that patients still have a choice of what physician they want to go see. And even if the hospital uh, has the strength and numbers, a good practicing physician will still have the ability to access patients and have patients come to them. Let's talk about what the financial structure is of the offer. Is it a lump sum? offer? Is it an income stream? And is that income a guarantee? Is it based on RVUs? Is it an income guarantee with bonuses based on RVUs? Is it a guaranteed income and no RVUs? There are a number of different ways that the deal can be structured, 
from a financial standpoint. Is the lump sum payout that the hospital is going to provide an upfront check to you based on evaluation? And that's key. How is the hospital determining the price in which they're going to purchase your practice? What valuation did they use? How did they base that? Was it based on RVUs, number of charts, number of patients, assets in the practice? Number of different ways that evaluation can be done. Is the valuation fair and equitable to you? When that lump sum check comes, how is that lump sum check going to be distributed to you from a tax perspective? Very key and crucial. Are they going to tax that? Is that money going to be taxed to you as ordinary income tax? Or is that money going to be taxed to you in a long-term capital gains manner? An example, if the medical practice purchase price to the, each physician was going to receive a check of a million dollars, if that was taxable to them at ordinary income tax rates in today's environment, let's say roughly a 40% tax effective tax rate in today's environment, there's $400,000 going to taxes. If it's taxed in a long-term capital gains manner of 15% in current environment, that's a $150,000 tax bill that's due. That's a significant savings on how a lump sum payment is going to be distributed to you the physician owner from the hospital after the valuation is determined. Very crucial to have appropriate advisors involved, tax advisors involved with this discussion and negotiation to maximize your tax efficiency. With that lump sum payout, does the hospital then assume all of the practice debt? Does the lump sum get split equally between the partners of the firm or not? What method was determined with that lump sum payout to compensate multiple partners in the group? Was it based on those multiple partners' time in the group? Was it based on how productive they were in the years past? There needs to be a formula which can cause some internal strife because now you're determining who's getting a bigger chunk of the pie or is the pie being equally split up? If you have, in a, as an example, if you have a medical practice with physicians that are in their late 50s, early 60s, and some in their 40s, should the older physicians, maybe not working as hard right now or taking more time off, be compensated more because they built the practice over a longer period of time? Or should the younger ones who are producing more revenue take a bulk of that? That discussion is key to have internally before you move forward with any external discussions with the hospital. Is the income compensation actually going, that is going to be paid to each of the physicians, is that income going to be taxed as W-2 wages to the employees? Are they not going to be eligible to receive any other types of distributions, whether that's bonuses that are taxed in a different manner or not. If you're an employee of an organization, compensation that you received is taxed in only one way. That's in W-2 format. You don't receive any of the benefits of being in private practice and being able to select your corporate structure and your tax structure to eliminate some taxes that are unnecessary. We'll talk more about that uh, later on in the, in the presentation. Is the hospital's income stream that they're going to provide to you a guaranteed income stream? Or is it truly going to be based on productivity? It would obviously be better if you could get the hospital to agree for a guaranteed stream of income for a certain period of time, three years, five years, and to guarantee that income based on your highest grossing your high, highest grossing years of personal income. That's the ideal structure to do. Most hospital compensation practices have a guarantee for a short period of time, 12 to 24 months, after which time they have a production-based formula typically tied to the RVU system. What are the current benefits that are you're providing in your medical practice versus the benefits that the hospital is providing to you. These benefits 
can range in what type of retirement plan are you participating in at your practice now? What type of non-qualified retirement plan do you have in place? What health insurance do you have? What types of expenses are you getting reimbursed right now? Whether that's a CME course like this that's being reimbursed by your practice or a CME course that you would have to pay for out of your own pocket because the hospital, as a hospital employee, they don't provide for that because they provide continuing medical education on site all the time and you now don't have the ability to travel to, to courses that are of interest to you to get your continuing medical education credit. Do you do marketing? And if you do marketing, how are those marketing efforts, uh, how are they promoted? How are you promoted in the community? Do you still want to be promoted in the community? Does the does the hospital provide those types of services as well? When we look at retirement plans, a significant benefit that's being provided to you because it's the way to save for the vast majority of your money for retirement. In your current practice, do you provide a qualified retirement plan? And how does that current qualified retirement plan work whether it's a defined contribution plan or a defined benefit plan or a combination of both, allowing you to get maximum amount put away. In 2010, the maximum amount of contribution into a qualified retirement plan of a defined contribution nature was $49,000 plus any catch up if you're over 50 years of age. That amount stayed the same for 2011. It, will, it typically goes up as years move on, indexed against inflation, has stayed steady the last few years at that number. If you move to the hospital-based system, will the hospital system provide a retirement plan such as a 403B plan, which would now limit you to a contribution of your own deferral of $16,500 in 2010 and 11, as well as catch-ups if you're over age 50. That is a drastic reduction in the amount of money you can save on a pre-taxed basis. Also in your retirement plan, you can have a non-qualified plan in place at your medical practice that the hospital organization may or may not have. Does that hospital provide a non-qualified plan? More often than not, you won't see hospitals provide non-qualified plans. You will see the hospitals that I mentioned provide just the 403B plan. If they have an additional plan, it's typically a 457B or F plan, which again, the maximum amount that can be contributed there is $16,500 plus catch-up as well. So even with that, you would still be less than what you could contribute to a defined contribution plan at the private practice level. In addition, at the private practice level, you have your, your ability to do a defined benefit plan where you, based on an age and an actuarial formula, would be able to even put away greater amounts of money for retirement. Those benefit features at the retirement plan level are extremely important to evaluate because you will, for certain, have a loss of the ability to save money on a pre-tax basis by moving from the private practice sector into the hospital organization because the benefit plans they have for retirement are not as good or not as available as they are in the private practice setting. Additional current benefits that need to be looked at and reviewed are your health insurance. What health insurance is the private practice that you now own and are employed by providing to you? How will those health insurance benefits be provided to you at the hospital organization. Is the benefit as rich for you? Is it as rich for your employees and your staff? And we'll talk more about that as well. Are, if they're not the same, what kind of additional expenses or costs will it require you to have inside the hospital as a hospital employee that you didn't have as the owner in the private practice setting? An example is a most private practice settings will have a traditional health insurance plan where they have minimal co-plays and minimal out-of-pocket expenses. You move to a hospital organization that employs thousands of people or tens of thousands of people, they tend to have a less advantageous 
health insurance plan with higher deductibles and higher co-pays for which was at a direct cost to the physician. You need to evaluate what type of health insurance they have. In addition, you need to look at what type of disability plans do you have in your medical practice currently? And does that disability plan transfer over to the hospital? And what type of disability plan does the hospital offer you as well? Can you participate in it? Is it limited? Do you have to go through a complete underwriting again for disability insurance? And if you're older now, are you able to even get coverage? Are you going to lose the coverage from your medical practice when you transfer to the hospital? Those are all key questions that you need to be evaluating and thinking about because those are additional costs and expenses to you if you make the move from the private practice world to the hospital world. Additionally, the current benefits that you may lose, as we've touched on, is reimbursement for continuing medical education, reimbursement for marketing, potentially a reimbursement for an auto allowance, a car allowance that you have currently in the private practice setting that you won't be able to take advantage of as a hospital employee. Those additional ancillary benefits need to be added up and determine what economic value they have for you and we'll cover a one case study that just looks at the tax and retirement aspect of it but you need to add those benefits up in terms of costs and as you go through those costs compare and contrast to what the new offer looks like from the hospital other things to consider for uh, from a benefit standpoint are the scheduling patient hours call time and vacation as a private, in the private practice setting, and as the owner of the private practice, you dictate and determine your schedule, the amount of vacation that you want to, to take in a given year, when your hours will be, the call schedule that's, that, that you're adhering to as well. In a hospital setting and under a new employment agreement, they will dictate to you the amount of vacation time that you get, the number of sick days that you're allowed to take. They will dictate to you your call schedule they will dictate your, your patient hours as well. And certainly they'll, they'll ask for input from you uh, since it's a practice you've been running for a period of time. But at the end of the day, you now have, have lost the ability to make those major decisions because they'll be made by the hospital and the executive team of the hospital as they see fit for the hospital to be able to continue to make a profit. They're going to need you working a certain number of hours a day a certain number of hours a week in a year and vacation will potentially be limited. The typical employment contract for a hospital is a four week period of vacation. In the private practice setting that's six weeks of vacation currently. Are you willing to take a reduction in vacation time or a reduction in compensation because you want to take more vacation unpaid? Again, key things you need to look at and evaluate when making a determination on whether or not to make the move to a hospital organization. Another concern when evaluating this decision is whether or not current staff and your current team members are going to have job security. A lot of times, as we mentioned before, there's the efficiency in, in bigger numbers that can, be, that, that can help aid a practice. As a hospital comes in and takes over a medical practice, more often than not, they're going to be able to cut staff and overhead and have that provided by someone already in place on the hospital staff. Does that mean that someone who is a crucial team member to you, whether that's your office manager, the head nurse who may or may not have been there for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, or 25 years will now have a job at the new practice that is going to be owned by the hospital. Or will the hospital put in place their own team members? And when they put those own, their own team members in place, will those team members be full-time or part-time? Will you have an office manager who's there one day a week now? Or you used to have someone dealing with a lot of the the, the staff issues and troubles of the day-to-day -day management of the company all full, at full time that now is going to fall back on your lap. Those are concerns that you need to negotiate prior to signing the deal with the hospital. Make sure that key staff or all staff 
that are important to you are brought over in the deal with some guarantees for a period of time. Those are key decisions that need to be negotiated up front. Other things that you need to make sure is what if they want to add a new physician to your practice? Can you work and practice medicine in the same manner that that new physician is going to be practicing? Are you comfortable? If you, do you have any negotiation or say in whether or not they can add a physician or which physician they can add or will they just mandate or dictate to you what physician they want to put in that into your practice? What happens to various medical practice assets that you currently own in the sale to the hospital or by joining the hospital as an employee? What do I mean? What happens if you, as the physician, own your medical office building? Will the hospital purchase that medical office building? Will they get a valuation? Do you even want to sell that medical office building to the hospital or do you want to retain it as an asset, a personal asset, and have the hospital now pay you rent for your medical practice being in there? That's a key discussion if you have a real estate asset owned through the medical practice or by one of the physician owners that the medical practice is currently utilizing, whether that's multiple clinics that you might have and or own multiple office locations that you might own there, that are, there are medical practices in those offices and locations. You need to make a decision. Do we want to sell those as part of the whole package or do we want to retain those and have rent now paid to us, the physician owners, by the hospital? In addition, you need to look at what's going to happen to any equipment that we currently have that has been expensive that we've purchased and potentially depreciated over a period of time. Is the hospital purchasing that equipment? Does the hospital have their own equipment? What if there's outstanding liabilities on that equipment now and the hospital does not want to purchase that? How are you going to deal with that issue? Those are concerns that you need to make sure you address in the beginning stages of the negotiation as well. In addition, what happens to your accounts receivable? Are those purchased by the hospital? Are they owned by the hospital? Are they owned by you and you continue to collect on them? Do you sell those accounts receivable off to a factoring company uh, because they're not part of the, the deal when you sell to the hospital? Again, that, another asset that's a big concern is your accounts receivable. What about if you have a surgery center? in place that you own. Now with the hospital buying your medical practice, can you even continue to operate and own that surgery center? Do you want to operate and own that surgery center? There are additional legal questions that need to be answered there as well as accounting issues that need to be addressed there. But if you have a surgery center, that is a key asset that's been deriving income for you. It, will it continue to derive income or not? What are the le legal repercussions of having patients go there versus the hospital? A whole different area that needs to be addressed prior to you trying to make a decision of joining a hospital or not. Your medical malpractice coverage. There are two types of medical malpractice coverage. There are claims made policies and there are occurrence policies. In an occurrence policy, the premium is paid and whenever the act occurred, that carrier is on the hook for it. So in the event that I had a policy that was occurrence-based five years ago, and I'm at a different carrier now, and a claim arises that happened five years ago, that prior carrier is on the hook for those claims. If I have a claims-made-based policy, that is whenever the claim is made. And because whenever the claim is made, you may not be the same time you have that same insurance company. You need to make sure you have tail coverage. So one of the things that you need to also be aware of and look at is if the practice, the hospital is going to buy the medical practice and my malpractice coverage is claims made coverage, are they going to buy the tail coverage for me? Because that's an extremely expensive, can be an extremely expensive proposition. Are they not going to buy the tail coverage for me and that is an additional expense that I'm going to have to take and eat up out of my own pocket. Again, the malpractice side, uh, coverage side, is a very important thing to start talking with and negotiating with the hospital if you're considering 
being purchased. Additionally, with the malpractice issue, it is believed that hospitals have very deep pockets and can cover any exposure that the physician may have from any claim that might arise. Is that truly the case, or is there now potentially more exposure by being a hospital employee? Typical malpractice lawsuits in the hospital environment name every physician that was part of the team treating the patient in the malpractice suit. So are you exposing yourself to a diff additional liability by being a hospital employee and part of a team now and having you named in a medical malpractice lawsuit? Or are you reducing that exposure? The hospital has deeper pockets, more money, and can protect you better or shield you better from malpractice claims. There have been many examples that have been out in court cases, but having just a claim made against you and your name on that claim gives a blemish to your record. Even if that is not founded to be accurate, it still is something that people can find when researching and analyzing whether they want you to be their physician. So can that hurt your ability to get new patients because if you're part of a hospital and the hospital, a patient from the hospital sues the hospital and they name all physicians that treated that patient in the lawsuit and even if you reviewed a chart and didn't even see the patient, does that bring more exposure to your personal record and your ability in the future to get patients? I'm going to cover a case study now on Dr. Oscar, the orthopedic surgeon who is currently in private practice. Let's make a few assumptions about Dr. Oscar. First off, Dr. Oscar is a 45-year-old physician with a very growing and successful practice as an orthopedic surgeon. He has currently set up his medical practice to be an LLC taxed as an S corporation. He has practice revenue that was actually collected revenue of $1.8 million. He had practice expenses of $1 million. And that $1 million of expenses included a defined benefit plan, a defined contribution plan, and additional car and business related expenses that benefited the physician that allowed for him to get deductions of around an additional $10,000 included in that million dollars of expenses. He took wages in two forms. Under S corporation rules, wages can be paid out in two forms, W-2 wages or S distribution wages. W-2 wages are all subject to the FICA tax. S distribution wages are not subject to the 2.9% FICA tax. In our example, Dr. Oscar has elected to take his $800,000 of compensation, half as W-2 wages and half as S distributions. Now there's no clear rule or guidance uh, from the Internal Revenue Service on how much must be W-2 wages and how much can be S distribution. So for our example, we just split it at a 50-50 ratio. However, you can find uh, a number of, of physician practices that would be operating that or taking that income of 800,000 as 100,000 of W-2 and 700,000 of, of S distributions or vice versa. So there's no hard stead fact there. But the only thing we can say is if you move to the hospital-based employee, all wages are W-2 wages now to you. So let's go through the mathematical example. In his private practice currently, the defined contribution plan uh, gross amount in 2011 that he could contribute would be $49,000. He has a defined benefit plan in where he is able to put another $45,000 in. He has expenses that we talked about uh, of $10,000, and he has S distributions that he's taken out of $400,000. His federal income tax savings in a 40% marginal rate allow for that savings of all of those benefits on defined contribution, defined benefit, and the deduction of expenses of 19,600, 18,000, and 4,000, and then the S distribution of $11,600 of savings because it's 2.9% on that, to give him a total of $53,200 of tax savings, B 
being in the private practice setting. So that's a significant amount of tax savings for any one individual that owns their own practice to, to put in place. This is obviously assuming that the physician did things based on having two retirement plans, the, the defined benefit plan, the defined contribution plan, and also that they were taking the distributions of incomes in a 50% 50-50 ratio between distribution and W-2 wages. Now, let's assume Dr. Oscar becomes a hospital employee. He's that same 45-year-old orthopedic surgeon, but now he has all $800,000, assuming the hospital agreed to pay him the same amount of, re of wages that he had earned in the previous years. He has all $800,000 as W-2 wages. So all $800,000 is, is no S distributions are going to be taken out there. It's all coming to him in W-2 wages, which it can be somewhat of a benefit for him because the, the and we'll look at that in a second, the amount of taxes that he is responsible for is cut in half because the employer picks up the other half of it. But he only has a 403B plan offered now, and he's able to put that $16,500 that we talked about in the past away into there. Let's take a look at how that will affect him now. He is now a physician employed by the hospital. He has a 403B plan of $16,500 that he's putting away, saving him roughly $6,600 in taxes. And he's got the FICA Medicare portion because the hospital is going to cover a half of the Social Security tax of $6,622. He's responsible for the remaining $6,622, thus giving him a $13,222 tax savings. If we compare the private practice savings of $53,200 and the hospital savings of $13,222, his actual benefit by staying in the private practice from real dollars, real savings dollars, is $39,978. That's a significant difference on an annual basis and could be greater depending on whether or not the hospital agreed to pay an $800,000 income to the physician or not, whether the hospital even provided a, qualif a retirement plan for the physician to participate in or not. In the private practice world, the physician made the decision on those, those issues. So Dr. Oscar, from a pure economic example here, is better off staying in private practice for just pure dollars and cents fact. Let's talk about another example of a group of physicians that in 2005, they were a 21-member primary care group. They sold off their practice and their ancillary business to a hospital system. Each physician in that hospital system, or each physician uh, that was part of that group cashed a check for a little over $500,000 taxes long-term capital gains. In 2007, the hospital system went, actually went belly up and the physicians took back their medical practice, didn't cost them anything, and their ancillary services. In 2008, at the end of 2008, they sold to another health system and each physician cashed a check of a little over $400,000 upon doing that and locked into a salary guarantee of their highest levels of the last three years. In 2009, that health system merged with another health system which caused the physicians to become disgruntled the physicians then sued the health system to get out of their agreement and keep their compensation that they received, which they successfully did, and were back in currently owning their own practice and their ancillary services. In my example there, we've shown that physicians, each of those individual 21 physicians collected a little over, close to a million dollars from being purchased by multiple systems, but they went through years of Law, uh, negotiations with various health systems and then at the end having to sue a current health system to get out of the deal. Was it a financially better deal? Certainly you can make the case for it. Did it take away from their ability to practice medicine and a, a big distraction for the group? Yes it did. Does it mean that it was the wrong decision? 
at the time, they, were, they, they felt that it was a good decision to make both moves and then get out of the second move that they did. But there's an example where physicians were paid a significant sum of money to make a move and still now, at the end of the day, are practicing medicine. Not something that we would advise looking into or doing, but at the end of the day, is something worth considering on the lump sum is how do I get out of an agreement with the hospital if I get into it and I don't like it? What are the repercussions to me as the owner uh, that is now the employee if I want to leave or vacate the offer that was given to me? Are there non-competes put in, put in place or not? If you're going to make the move or decide to make the move, the advice would be to ask for the moon if you're making the move. Ask the hospital for your entire wish list of things up front and in the beginning. Ask them for long-term salary guarantees with bonuses being paid to you based on production, but lock in a salary guarantee of the last three years highest average income for you as a guarantee at a minimum for a three or five year period of time. Upfront buyout, you want that money taxed as long-term capital gains to you. You want to make sure that that can happen. You want to make sure that you consult with your tax advisors, the accountants for the hospital, and that that is worked out, that the, that money paid to you in an upfront bonus or an upfront buyout number is taxed as long-term capital gains. We want to see if you want all your real estate that's held by the medical practice, if you want all of that to be purchased, you want to negotiate that upfront. And you want obviously valuations that you're getting independent of what the hospital's doing so that you can negotiate the best deal as well for that. If you want to keep the real estate, you want to negotiate your agreement for the hospital paying rent for a 10 year period of time or a five year period of time. You want that agreement, that lease agreement put in place before you execute and move to becoming a hospital employee. A good source of revenue if you own the building for a period of time. The concern would be, could you sell that medical building five years from now or 10 years from now in light of what's gone on in the real estate market over the last few years? It may be better off to get the building sold now and take the asset, the value of the money and deploy it into a different type of an investment. You need to discuss all of those things in advance. Will they um, retain all of your key employees that you want? Remember, negotiate that in advance. What is the exit strategy for, you know, built, in, built into the purchase in the agreement as we talked about uh, previously, are they giving you an out or, or, or not? And what does that look like? You want the best and most favorable out. Additional retirement plans that you can get the hospital to put in place for you would be very important. You would want the hospital to try to adopt additional plans that can favor you in a tax favorable manner to save money. You want the hospital to put that in place, especially if it's at no or little cost to the hospital. A type of plan that the hospital could put in place would be a type of a non-qualified retirement plan or a hybrid retirement plan. That plan would be at, in addition to the retirement plan that the hospital has in place, it would be minimal or no expense for the hospital to explore that type of plan. Each physician that's employed by the hospital could make a decision as to whether or not they want to participate in it. They can make a decision at varying contribution amounts as well into that type of a plan. And it's something that you should, in advance, ask the hospital to look at. Non-qualified plans have benefits of uh, some tax-favorable treatment on the front end, tax-deferred growth, tax-free withdrawals on the back end as well. So there are a lot of different non-qualified hybrid type of retirement plans that a hospital could put in place that you may want to ask for when negotiating the agreement with the hospital so that they can include that as part of a benefit package. We saw in our example where Dr. Oscar went from saving significant amounts of money, uh, you know, over $90,000 a year to only being able to save $16,500. That was a big reduction. But if he joined the hospital and the hospital provided him ways to save money on a tax efficient way through a non-qualified or a hybrid plan, that would be a, a great tool 
uh, for the physician to, to be able to utilize to get make up some of that lost savings. Another option is to explore how to be financially efficient and stay in your current practice. Take a look at how your practice is structured currently. Does it have the optimal legal structure in place? Does it have, is it taxed in the most desirable manner to give you the best tax benefits? Uh, take a look at your current practice to see if you can find a corporate structure that would mean lower taxes. Take, uh, take a look at cost cutting measures that you could, you could put in place uh, right now at your current practice to help save dollars. Uh, adopt better benefit plans that help reduce your taxable income. See if you can avoid being acquired by a hospital by just being financially more efficient. That is a tool that you can use uh, to, to check to see if you really want to go in and work for somebody else or if you want to keep working for yourself or working with a group of partners in a medical practice. In summary, Changes in the healthcare environment are causing physicians to trade the risks and rewards of private practice for the safety of hospital or a salaried employee. Financially, as we demonstrated here, that isn't always necessarily, it's not necessarily the case. In addition to that, maybe for some of the headaches that get, get eliminated by joining the hospital, you reduce the ability to save money in a tax efficient way and you're you're now going to be governed by a, a hospital organization that is going to dictate to you how you will run your practice and how you will treat patients moving forward. Those are key things that you need to think about when determining whether you want to be purchased by a hospital or not. That concludes another in a continuing series of programs on medical malpractice, risk management, healthcare law, practice management, and selected clinical topics. Presenting was Mr. Jason M. O'Dell, CWM.